Good afternoon, everybody. Judy Maggio with Austin PBS Decibel. And today we have a very recognizable guest, the former state senator, now dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs, Kirk Watson. Thanks so much for being with us. It's my pleasure, Judy. Thank you. You know, we'll get to the meat of this interview in a minute, but I, I first want to just talk to you about your life for the last six weeks. Um, Give us a glimpse of what you've been up to during this this uh, stay at home period. Well, it, it's like everybody. It's it's been a big difference and a big change. Um, you know, back in February, I announced that I was going to uh, leave the Senate and take this new job as the the founding dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs down in Houston, and really anticipated that a couple of things would happen. One is I would have a very orderly. A shutting down of my Senate office and an orderly shutting down of my law office. I'd have the ability to go to Houston and look for a place to live and, uh, and really, you know, interact with the staff and the faculty and, and others at U of H. And of course that completely changed uh, like all of our lives did. Uh, I also had anticipated and I, and I miss this aspect of it a great deal. I anticipated using March and April to, move around this community I love so much and see people and go to dinners and events and tell them I love them and thank them for the letting me do what they've let me do for so long. So life's been different, uh, of course, I've, I've, like all of us. I've, we've worked remotely. And I've had to find a place to live in Houston remotely. Uh, I've, I've put a lease on a place uh, that I've never been in. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that works out. And I'm doing, I've been working remotely with um, people that can help educate me about what I need to know as I start this new job, which I started last Friday. So let's go back to right before that, April 30th, uh, your last day at midnight, yeah. last day as the senator from this Central Texas region, the state senator for 13 years. Yeah. And I know that you didn't plan on having a pandemic, but um, interrupt kind of those plans. but. Give us that last day in office. I know it must have been bittersweet. I know there were all kinds of accolades on social media. Yeah, um, which was a nice surprise to me. Um, I, 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 will, I, I will readily admit that last week was a difficult week for me. Um, you know, I've, I've, uh, we've been in this town since 1981. Uh, I first ran for public office in 90, announced in 96 and was elected mayor in 97. Uh, and then, as you say, for over 13 years, I've been in the Texas Senate. This, it's, it's my life. And so, uh, particularly when I haven't been able to do what I'd hoped to do, which is go out and hug people and touch them and tell them how much I appreciated them and how, how much it's meant to me that they've lifted me up for all these years. Last week was not an easy week. Um, I must admit, though, that it was, um, it was touching and gratifying, uh, the social media uh, response on that last day, because it was a surprise to me. And so um, I, love the, I love the people of this place, and I love this town. So uh, the, the 30th came and went, and we're now on to, to other things. You got some virtual hugs. Those hashtag thank you Watsons were all over the place. Nice. Yeah, no, it, it meant a lot to me. It was very touching, very moving. Before we look forward and look back, and that's really what I want to do today. I want to look forward to where we are as a state. I know you're on the task force. I want to look back at the many accomplishments you've had in office over the two decades that you've served this community. But before we do that, why was this job the one that lured you out of public office, uh, becoming dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston? Well, um, I was very happy in the Texas Senate. Uh, in fact, I came out of the last session, the 2019 session. Um, I'd been elected by my peers to be the president pro tem of the Senate. Uh, and that has a lot of neat stuff that goes along with it. Um, and, uh, I'd had what I could argue was maybe my best session ever, uh, kind of at the top of my game in terms of what we were able to do with open government, uh, restoring the Public Information Act and what we were able to do with uh, open, the Open Meetings Act. And we built on uh, the work we had done in previous legislative sessions with regard to 
to sexual assault and sexual violence, particularly on college campuses. Um, and then uh, the lieutenant governor made me um, put me on the the education committee in an education session, which was it was the session for education. And I ended up on the um, conference committee for HB3, which was the school finance bill, and got to play a real pivotal role in the negotiation of that bill. So I came out of the session happier than I had been. Uh, one of my jokes, and it's really not that big a joke, it's kind of the truth, is that you can always tell how my mood was coming out of a legislative session on whether or not I had a new motorcycle shortly after that. And uh, I didn't have any, I didn't feel any need to buy a new motorcycle. So that tells you how happy I was. And your wife must have been so pleased about that. Yes, that's right. It's very good to see that. But it, it, here, here's the thing. Um, I got offered this opportunity. And I, the only way, the point of me giving that background is to say, the only reason I would leave uh, a job I loved and, and, and do it under uh, circumstances where I even leave Austin is it had to be a really compelling platform. Uh, it, it had to be a compelling platform for service because that's the itch that I obviously want to scratch. And what a compelling platform this was uh, to be able to uh, be part of building a public policy school essentially from the ground up uh, and to do it in a city that's one of the largest cities in America. It's fourth largest city in America and arguably one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse cities. To, to be in a position to be able to do that was something that, that really intrigued me and attracted me. And uh, so I, I decided that's what I was going to do. It was, you know, it was actually probably a good time to say, uh, I'm gonna go do something else when you leave happy and you leave excited and you have something that uh, excites you. Now, I'm, I'm willing to admit uh, to you and everybody watching this that uh, it, it, it comes with some anxiety. You know, the, I'm a little anxious about it because I want to do it right and do it well. And there's a lot that I, mean, I don't know what I don't know. But, but I actually attribute that anxiety and that anxiousness, that adult anxiousness, to the excitement that goes with it. And, and Judy, I'll, I'll say one other thing, which you didn't really ask, but, but I'll add to it. I, I accepted the job before this COVID-19 pandemic changed the world as we know it. And it's changed everything yes. about how we do things. How, look at this. Uh, you and I were going to do something uh, about my book, you know, before I left office. And we were going to do that in person and couldn't do it. Uh, it's changed the way we gather. It's changed the way we shop. It's changed the way we educate, worship, uh, just reach out to each other. But it's also going to change the way. In fact, I think it has to change the way we do public policy. And so being a new dean in a new era adds to that level of excitement because I'm going to be in a position to help educate and shape public policy makers that will be governing and dealing with issues as we come into this new condition that we're going to be living in. But I'm also going to be in a position to help those who are governing and making public policy while we're in, well, while we're transitioning into that condition. Um, and I intend for the hobby school to be involved in every aspect of government in that way and be helpful. Um, and, and of course, to educate the, the, the future. Well, let's talk about the condition that we are in, because um, though you are no longer in office, you have been chosen to an elite group called the Governor's Strike Force. Yeah. So I want you to pull back the curtain a little, if you will, and talk about how some of these decisions have been made, who is weighing in on them, what research you're looking at, because there, there's been some um, cries of too much too soon, especially from members of your party. So well, talk about the governor reopening. Well, so um, I'm, I'm honored that I was asked to be a part of this. Um, and, and you're right, there are cries of, uh, there are cries on both sides. Um, and, and I, you know, my position is that part of the reason I'm, I'm happy to be on this and willing to be a part of it is because 
uh, I don't think we need to make all this a binary choice. And, and it's not an all or nothing, you know, winner take all sort of decision making process. And in, in my conversations with the governor and in, in uh, conversations with the whole group, uh, he made it very clear when he asked me to do this, that he was going to base this on science and, and medical professionals. And the medical professionals that he has involved with it, in it, of course, are people that, that we recognize their names um, and are, are, are first class. Uh, people from you know, the head of infectious disease at the Dell Medical School, uh, Dr. McClellan, who has a joint appointment, uh, Dr. Hellerstadt, Dr. Zerwas. So the idea has always been to do this in a way that's based in science. And I'm not for anything that's not based in science. And uh, I'm happy to, to state points of view that if I, if I think they're not. But be recognizing that at the same time we're doing that, there are a lot of people that are really, really suffering economically. And being able to get them in a situation where their livelihoods and their ability to take care of their families and to pay their bills, um, if we can get them in a position where they can do some work, that is something we ought to at least be looking at. And, and the idea that you might can do some of that in a partial way becomes very important. Now, I will tell you, I don't always agree with everything that happens. Um, and it's not, this has not been a situation where there is 100%, everybody gets, gets a vote and, and then they do it based upon votes and that kind of thing. Instead, we're, we, we provide a lot of input. Uh, we provide input from the public and others that want to uh, share their points of view. We can share our point of view. And then the, the, the governor, uh, runs that through his medical experts and scientists, and then, that, then he makes decisions about how he, he wants to move forward because ultimately it's his order. So I'm gonna ask this in a different way. What, as a Texan and a former state senator, what gives you pause about the aspect of, of reopening? Well, a couple of things, one is, I start with the, the, the proposition that this has to be grounded in good science and it has to be done in such a way where we're not uh, incre increasing the likely too much. We're not, we're not inappropriately increasing the likelihood that people are going to get this disease and people are going to die from this disease. In addition to that, and I would add that as a, as, as a corollary, that we do it in such a way that we don't, uh, you know, to use the old trite phrase, bite off our nose to spite our face, and we move so rapidly that what happens is we have spikes and, and we find ourselves having to try to put the horses back in the barn after we've let them out, even let a few of them out, and we've created a problem. So I kind of start with that as a premise. Uh, that being said, uh, I think we should have testing and tracing I worry about where we are with testing and tracing. I worry that, that if we were going to have a more robust program of testing and tracing and ramp that up as, par as part of phase one, I think I would have preferred to see that be phase one and then, then do some partial openings so that you're not having to try to figure out what the corresponding increases you might see have to do with either increased testing or an increase in the incidence of the disease because of some of the things that you might have done in terms of the partial opening. And then I, I, I think uh, right now, one of the things that I have concerns about is not sticking with the plan. Uh, if you're gonna have phase one, let's see how that works before you start doing additional reopenings since we said we were gonna do those in phase two. Now, I think there was always some wiggle room in that. And I, and I recognize that as somebody that served in office, but, but that concerns me because I, I worry that it sends inconsistent messages at a time where we need to be consistent. You talked about wiggle room and, and I've known you long enough. I think I can say this. I, I think your superpower is, is finding common ground and Thank collaborating. You. Thank you. That's not happening right now. Um, it seems like this pandemic, rather than 
as, as you saw happen during 9-11, that it seemed to bring people together. Right now, we're witnessing a phase where it seems to be polarizing. If you could wave your magic wand, what, what would you like to tell people who are the decision makers now about the importance of collaborating and compromising during this challenging time? Good question. And, and I'm going to take a step back and, 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 and remind myself um, about the context in which a question like that gets asked. First, I think the reason we're doing so well in Texas and in Austin is because people got the message and they acted well. They, they did, uh, I think there's a lot to be said for how, how smart people reacted to this. Now, a few were outliers, um, but that's gonna happen and you're never gonna get 100% uh, uh, good conduct. Um, but, but the fact that we, the numbers didn't end up where some were predicting they would or could, I think is in large part a, a function of people coming together and doing some of what, uh, what we're talking about. Not people, though, not politicians. Well, hang, people. Hang, hang on, I'm gonna get there. You're, you're right. But, but that's when, when, when they had clarity of what it was they needed to, be, to do, you saw them react to it in a positive way. And by the way, there wasn't real good clarity at first, if you remember. Yeah. We, we were getting a lot of, 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 of different and differing uh, statements about what you could or couldn't do under these circumstances. But once it became clear that you need to be sheltering in place, you saw people, as, as a general rule, do very well. But here's been our biggest problem. The best way to get to collaboration the best way to do that is to speak plainly and to be clear in leadership positions. Even if people disagree with you, if, you, if you're clear with them about what the requirements are, you're going to get pretty good compliance and at least an effort to go along in something like a crisis like this. And the truth is that at the very top, we didn't have that. The president has been, he has been, he's been bad under these circumstances and the lack of clarity and the, the jerky nature of his leadership has created, I think, the opening for us to fall back into an easy way of dealing with issues and treat a global pandemic as though it's a simple political issue, and it's not. And I think that's part of the reason we're seeing the polarization. So Dean Watson, <laughs> if you are giving a lesson to your uh, students at the Hobby School of Public Affairs about this time in our history, what will be some of the lessons that you think you, you'll want to pass along to them? Well, a, a couple, uh, and you've heard some of the, me, me use some of these before, but, but they, they work. One is throw away labels. Don't, don't do the old political label game because what happens is I then don't hear your good ideas. Have everybody involved. In a, another way of saying that is make sure you're involving everybody and you're not excluding people based upon their political party or their, their uh, their point of view on some other issue and you've got a label put on. Second, I mentioned a minute ago, and that is speak plainly. Let people know what needs to be done and why you are making the decisions you're making so that they understand why it's important for them to follow that. The third would be to say, listen carefully. And what I mean by that is listen to the experts. Make sure your decisions are grounded in expert advice and not just political rhetoric so that the, the science ends up winning the day as opposed to uh, trying to score political points with a, with a narrow constituency. And then the final part of that lesson would be hope matters. Mm -hmm. and, and our goals ought to be 
to make sure we're making decisions and we're taking action in a way that assures we're going to ha have a good result. And, and I guess I said that was the last one, but a, a key part of that is that be willing to admit when you might not have the right decision, it's okay. It's okay, particularly in a time of crisis, it's okay to say, wow, that didn't work. I'm gonna fail quickly and we're gonna move on. We're gonna learn from that. And, and that's very important in a time of crisis. And, and, and at the top, I'm not sure we've seen that at all. You mentioned hope and there is a, there's a, a, a wonderful resiliency that comes with hope. So before we talk about your time in the legislature and, and your time as mayor, so I really do wanna talk about some of the legacy items. What gives you hope right now? Well, I will tell you that, that um, watching, I talked about it just a second ago, watching how generally people have reacted to this, um, while we can't hug each other and we can't uh, touch each other and we're supposed to uh, be physically distant from each other, you know, when you're, when you're out walking the dog on the street and you see other people walking the dog, the recognition in people's eyes and the fact that we're doing what we need to do to protect each other, uh, you know, it's an act of love. And, and what we're seeing people do to protect one another, and, and that's moved me. Um, so that gives me a, a, lot of, a, a lot of hope. The other thing that gives me hope is, and, and, and I'm optimistic about this, maybe more than I should, that we'll, we'll, we'll find out whether I'm right. But, but part of the hope is that one of the things that this uh, very significant, horrific event, and I think it's more than an event, it's clearly a big event, but, but what this event has done is it's created a new condition. And as part of the event, it has laid bare some things that we've argued about and fought about, in my view, uh, out of a perceived luxury that we, we just don't need to address those kinds of things. Uh, we, we don't need to worry about those or we can make those partisan political things. But what's happened is the event has laid bare some of the cracks in the way we go about doing things. And so we're, we're in this timeout. We're all in time, it's, it, we've all, everybody's called a timeout. And now we can evaluate what was working and what wasn't working so that when we go back into the game, I really hope that what we don't do is just try to reinvent the old playbook and just go back to the way we were. Instead, this is an immense opportunity during this time out to analyze where we need to go with a new playbook. You know, the, 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 the social safety net unraveled really rapidly. I mean, I could make an argument less than a week. Debates that we used to have about um, paid sick leave. We had, we had the, at least the perceived affluence that allowed us to say, we're going to make that an issue that we're not going to talk about. But what did we do right off the bat once this hit? We went right to it. The concept of the uninsured and, and this, this luxury of affluence that comes with, oh, well, sure, we have so many uninsured, but we can, it's okay, we can get by with that. Well, employer-based health care real quickly changes when people are no longer employing people. So those are the kinds of things that what I hope we will do, um, in fact, I'm working on something right now that will that'll be out shortly, where what we do is we create a new playbook for resiliency and we treat our economy, we have the opportunity to treat our economy in a way where we come out this stronger and better than we were before. And that's a long way of saying that gives me hope. The resiliency of hope? Yeah. So the, when the Texas legislature does meet, and I know you won't be there this time around, not as a state senator, but there's going to be this double whammy, right? There, 
the, the collapsed oil market, number one. Number two, the economic hit, the huge economic hit, COVID-19 yeah. has, has dealt this state. Um, gonna watch from the sidelines wanting to play? Or are you gonna watch from the sidelines going, glad I'm not dealing with that right now. Um, well, certainly everybody's gonna call me and want my opinion, don't you think? Um, but, but actually, here's what I here that that's a great example of what I was just talking about about how now's a good time to throw away the old playbook. So yes, there's at least two whammies to that state budget, right? And it's gonna be it's gonna be hard. But one of the things that the this pandemic has shown is that. Our state budget, which we talk about the, the luxury, the, the perceived luxury of affluence. We always knew, you know, Texas is going to come out of this. You know, we, 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 we've got a lot of money in the, in the energy sector. We're, we're doing great with regard to, to sales tax receipts. And so we've always acted like we don't really need to reevaluate how it is we finance state government. Well, now we've been shown we're not as resilient as we might think we are. So what can we, how, what should we do under those circumstances? Well, in my view, we should not just act like, okay, it's just the same old deal. Let's show up at the legislative session and we'll, we'll do this. You know, there, certainly there's going to be belt tightening and there's going to need to be cuts. But why not take this opportunity to now completely reevaluate the way we finance state government and ask the questions, are there other things we ought to be doing that would be more fair in the way we finance state government? And are there things that before we thought we had the luxury of just ignoring that maybe we need to, those were dormant conversations because we just weren't gonna go anywhere with them. Maybe we ought to put those back on the table. I hope that what we do is not just go in and act like we've only got one way of doing stuff, but instead let's reevaluate the whole mechanism. We're never going to have a better opportunity because we're never, hopefully, when I say that, hopefully we're never going to be in this sort of bad situation. We all hope that. Yeah. One more state policy question or state issue uh, that I want you to reflect on. You have spent many years pushing for the redevelopment of Interstate 35. Yeah. And th this comes with a very high price tag. And I'm wondering how you're feeling now about uh, the reality of what the uh, Texas Transportation Commission might do with that and, and where we are with, with those well, issues. Well, two, two things. One is that the commission just voted to go forward with that, which I think you have to, uh, on, on things like that, you need to keep the ball moving. The, the last thing, that we ought to be doing is uh, letting fear drive us more than than hope, and and pull in like a turtle. Um, we there are processes that need to keep st stay in place, including environmental processes and that kind of thing. But importantly, you've raised go back to what I was saying before. I've always believed that the better way of financing some of these projects is by putting in private capital that's pent up. There's pent up demand. And we can't right now, even before the pandemic, we couldn't afford all of the things we need to do when it comes to transportation infrastructure. And again, we kind of had this perceived feeling that, well, it, we'll be all right. We'll have enough to, to kind of get by. But now it's been laid bare that we, we, we don't because, because a big chunk of money that we use for mobility is with sales a sales tax set aside uh, that the voters voted for and rainy day fund money which is set gap, gap, oil and gas severance tax money so so why don't we come back and start asking the question is now the time to allow for private capital to be invested in some of these roadways because that's not taxpayer dollars it would be a way to have more money for more transportation infrastructure. It would put the risk on the private sector, uh, but we've we've said no to that for several years now. So that's another example, Judy, of, of where this pandemic ought to cause us to think about new playbooks. Well, and you start, certainly see some of these public-private partnerships blossoming during this time already. Right. 
Right. Well, that, look, there's a lot of there's, there has been a lot of pent up private capital, and there's uh, uh, we don't have enough money. Uh, we don't have enough money to do all the infrastructure that we need. And by the way, it's expensive, but it's a great way to stimulate the economy and put people to work right away. So why not consider those kinds of things and put them out there? Let's do a little looking back now. Um, sure. I remember covering you uh, on election night when you became mayor of Austin. What advice would you have given that newly minted mayor back in 1997? Um, 2020 hindsight now? Well, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting question. Uh, part of it would be to, um, to, to, to listen. Uh, and and I, I guess, which I, I think I, I did a pretty good job of because I, I, I knew at the time I was elected, you know, that's my first time in city government. And I knew I needed to listen, but, I, but when I made mistakes um, and, I re, and I evaluated where I was, uh, I would say there were two things that, that would result in, in some of that advice. One is listen and, and don't just think you're listening, really, really pay attention. Um, but the other, uh, the other bit of advice that I would give is um, recognize that Sometimes it's okay to, to, to have more patience than what you think you need to do in order to succeed. Um, my, uh, my, impa my impatience has been both one of the best qualities I've had in public life, but it's also been one of uh, my worst qualities in public life. Probably being a grandfather has improved your patience. Um, it's certainly, uh, yeah, uh, and, and she's something else. So, yes. Let's talk about some of your proudest accomplishments, though, as mayor of Austin. I, I know that uh, you didn't serve a long time, but that there was a lot packed into that, that term in office. Talk about some of your uh, greatest accomplishments in your mind that you, you're proud of, your legacy. Yeah, great. Um, well, first of all, I served four and a half years. Um, I served from uh, June of 97 until November of 2001. Um, and, and one of my proudest is, you'll remember this, and a lot of folks will remember, is that when I was first elected mayor, Austin had a de facto two-party system. It wasn't Republican and Democrat, because you're not elected as Democrat or Republican, but it was as nasty as anything you might see. It was environmentalist versus developer. Yeah, remember you remember that? Well. Yeah. And one of the things I said at the time was that I thought Austin was smart enough to wrap itself around more than just two sides of an issue. And you could find ways to collaborate uh, as you were nice enough to suggest uh, I, I do uh, a few minutes ago. And I think we changed the political dynamic in this town. And I feel very strongly about that and very happy about it. I'm also very proud that one of my uh, real pushes was to address downtown. People may not remember it, but there were only a couple of places to live in downtown Austin uh, in 1997. I said, we're going to, we were going to use the land that was owned by the city to help spur that kind of activity. And we did that. Uh, and I, I'm real proud of that. But we did a couple other things. Um, you know, for example, uh, we secured Austin's water future for, um, at that point, it was for 50 years, and it was then made where it could be for an additional 50 years. And that has proved to be something of, of great benefit. I'm also glad that while I've been in the Senate, I've been able to build on that by working with the Lower Colorado River Authority um, and, and the TCEQ to make sure that we dealt with the uh, LCRA's water management plan so that it actually built upon our securing the city of Austin's securing that water future. So those are, you know, we, we did work on race relations, uh, but, but those, are, those, those are some of the things that, that jumped to my mind most rapidly. You know, it's hard to recall a time when Austin's downtown was not the place to be and the place to live and the happening place for clubs, but, but you and I do remember that well. And, and I, I do recall that building of people wanting to live and work and play downtown. Yeah, you know, the truth of the matter is that, that in, in 97, um, 
couple things. One is City Hall, the City Hall we now know and, and enjoy, that was, that was where the, the temporary council chambers were located. And the land that that sits on was actually bought by the city of Austin back in the mid seventies. And they retrofitted a building to make it a, a temporary council chambers. Well, temporary isn't decades long. And so we used that. And if you remember at the time, we used that, we used the land on either side of that to lure computer sciences corporations, now where Silicon Labs we, we, it is located, to move them into downtown because part of the goal was, was to get past the old economy where the downtown was just populated during the day by uh, the bankers, the lawyers, and the real estate guys. But instead, I even talked about this never caught on. I don't know why it didn't catch on, but I used to refer to it as, we're going to create a downtown digital district. Well, that, like I say, that never caught on. But, um, but, but, but part of that was people told me you have to have more people living downtown. And my response was, okay, let's get more people living downtown. And then they said, well, whoa, 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 whoa. you can't get me more people living downtown unless you have more retail. And I'd say, okay, well, let's build more retail. And I said, well, you can't have retail until there are more people living downtown. So it was just this endless loop. Well, we had to do it at the same time. And so I pushed and we were able to succeed in getting that to be done. Uh, at the same time. So yeah, downtown today, uh, I, I feel great pride in because of uh, what we were able to achieve and what it means to our economy and the way of life in Austin, Texas. You ever worry though that it was too much of a good thing that now downtown has become so popular that it's not affordable anymore? Well, it, it, it's, it, that's always one of the problems that you have when you, you're, you're addressing things like this. And it, it, would be, it would be nice if we could figure out ways in a market economy, when you, when you create demand, how you're able then to limit uh, what, what that demand does in terms of cost. Well, you can work on that in policy at the, at the lobby go. school. All right, let's talk about your time in, in the state Senate. Talk about some of your, your most proud accomplishments there, because I know that you weren't always, well, you were never in the majority party, yeah. and I'm sure there were many uphill battles, but you were able to achieve some, some lasting things. Talk about those. Yeah, um, well, where I would start on that, um, well, before I get into a policy thing, I'll go back to, to something I'd said earlier. When I, as I leave the Senate right now, one of the things I'm proudest of is the relationships that I had in the Senate. Um, you know, uh, our politics get defined now so much by who you fight with as opposed to who you get along with that it sometimes, I think, damages how you, how you make public policy. And um, I, I really value the friendships and the relationships I had with uh, the members of the Senate, regardless of party. And it allowed me to do things that sometimes don't get seen because you know, that people are focused on a specific topic or a specific issue or a specific fight. But it allowed me along the way to improve bills that I didn't even vote for, that I was opposed to and still would vote against because I had a relationship where I could work with that senator. Uh, an example of that was I remember Senator Birdwell's bill uh, with, to, to allow guns on college campuses. Uh, I think I'm right when I say that he only took two amendments from the Senate floor and they were my amendments. Uh, I still voted against that bill and, and still opposed to that bill, but, but that was a way to, to make a difference on those bills because of the relationship I had with Brian, with Senator Birdwell, so that, that we could actually talk. And, I, and so as I leave the Senate, that's one of my proudest things is the, is the relationships. Now, with regard to policy, um, you know, I, I went in wanting to have greater transparency in government. And I even had early on what I called my honesty agenda uh, about the state budget. And we made a real difference. Uh, we, we, we changed the rules at one point. So that the bill, the budget bill had to be laid out sooner than it had been in the past so that the media and the public had a better opportunity to see it. Um, 
that we, we pass legislation that requires the legislative budget board to actually meet in public, for goodness sakes, at least once a year, um, uh, which uh, a, a great former senator one time, uh, I saw him in the Capitol, I said, what are you doing here? And he was on the LBB. I said, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, we're here for the Kirk Watson Memorial Annual Meeting uh, of the LBB, but things like that. And then of course, what I said a minute ago about restoring the Public Information Act, um, and, and the Open Meetings Act. I'm also really proud of the work I did um, on, on sexual assault, as, as I said, on college campuses. Um, and, and so, and I could go on and on on a number of bills. Being a senator and not on the Senate floor, the thing I'm proudest of, of course, is the fact that we have the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I mean, I just, I, I get chills when I think about that school, but especially with what we, we have done without it during the past couple of months. Um, I'm so uh, proud of the work that's being done there. In fact, tomorrow I will tape uh, my commencement speech to the first class of graduating students. Talk that's about- right, They're graduating. Yeah, that'd be the very first class. Yeah. Yes. And I'm, I'm, man, I'm honored that I get to be the guy that gives the, the commencement speech, although under conditions that are a little weird. But what it's doing right now with the Austin State Hospital and the role I've played in, in moving brain health in this community, uh, that's something else I'm very proud of. And, and then I'm gonna say as a matter of going back to what you said a minute ago about collaboration and, and building coalitions, the voters of, of Travis County when they were willing to listen, hear, and then invest in their futures by actually voting to raise their property taxes, invest in their futures in helping create the Dale Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, I'm very proud of them and that um, because I think it's made a world of difference and I think they're seeing a return, a big return on their investment. Well, practice those commencement speeches because I have a feeling you'll be attending a lot of commencements in the future. Uh, I, I'm going to move into what I, I'm going to call the lightning round. Okay. Uh, so we don't have too much time left. Uh, first thing, advice to the person who takes over State Senate District 14. Um, be willing to build relationships with the people that you're going to need to be working with, regardless of party. Because as you find yourself in the minority party, uh, of course, I just made an assumption there, didn't I? Um, but, but if you find yourself in the minority party, um, you're going to need those relationships. Work to create new constituencies out of that and don't create unnecessary enemies. Number one lesson you've learned as a state senator. Uh, number one lesson I've learned as a state senator. Um, that you can sure give a good speech and nobody will listen to it. <laughs> you began today by talking about how much um, this community means to you. And I, I feel the same way. I mean, I had a friend once say, is it possible to love a city the way you love a person? And, and I think that you and I both feel that way about yeah. the, the city of Austin, Central Texas. What message do you have for the people of this community who have um, supported you and, and worked with you in so many different ways in your role as mayor and state senator over the past 20 years? Um, it's a three-part message, I guess, Judy. One is um, thank you. Uh, thanks for the inspiration. Thanks for lifting me up. Thanks for holding me very tight and trusting me and compelling me to be willing to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, for this wonderful place that we all call home. So thank you. Two, um, you've, bought, it, it's, you've brought me great joy. I've tried to find the joy in public service and politics um, and, and I found it, but I found it in the people and in the, in the way they embrace me. And then the third thing would be, I love you. And um, I'm sorry that, that we've, we're going through this time where I haven't had 
as many opportunities to actually reach out to individuals and tell them I love them. But um, I moved here in 1981 for one year. I, I had a job. I had a job that was a one year job. And I thought we'd end up in North Texas, which is where we had grown up. Um, and we, in a, like in three months, it, it was love at first sight. And in three months, we were saying, we're not leaving. We're going to try to figure out a way to make a living in this town. And now here we are uh, almost 40 years later. And I, that, that love is, is strong and it's because of the people. And I love them. What do you think makes Austin such a unique place? You know, we all say keep Austin weird and, you know, we brag about everybody wants to move here, but, but as someone who's spent 40 years here, what do you think makes it so unique? Well, the, the easy answer is to say the people are, but, but a more complex answer to that is the people are because the people are open to various ideas and various points of views and people. Uh, it ain't just tolerance of different points of view and different ways of doing things. It's acceptance that you're just part of this deal we call Austin. I mean, that's how I've always thought of the keep Austin weird thing. Um, what does that mean? Well, very few ideas, even really great ideas, when you first say them to somebody, somebody's not going to say, wow, that's weird. Well, it's weird because we've never heard it before. Well, this is a town that said, wow, I've never heard that kind of music before. That's weird. But of course, there you go. You know, of course, Willie Nelson, one of the great lines in one of his songs is, I'd have to be weird to grow me a beard just to see what the rednecks would do. Well, he showed us and, and so, so it's, it's the people, but in a more complex way, it's the people who are willing to, to be weird and let whatever that new thought, that new idea, that new music be. And I'll add one other thing about that. I think that the, we sometimes don't give enough credit to having the University of Texas at Austin right in our midst because, yeah, um, I'm with you. Um, uh, but we don't have we have we don't give that enough credit. That's like a fountain of youth. <laughs> Every year, new weird ideas, thinking, music, and people come in and infuse our community. So I think that's a you know that's a big part of it. But it, it, it it's easy to say the people, but it's a it's a special kind of people that are attracted to it. What have we not talked about, Senator Watson, that you would like to say as you say goodbye to public office and say hello to running a school of public affairs in Houston? Well, I think we've covered it, but um, if I were to highlight anything that, that, that it would be um, that because I have this opportunity, it would be to again, highlight, emphasize, put in bold letters, how thankful I am, how grateful I am, how much joy I've had um, getting to be getting to be here, but getting to be the mayor, getting to be the senator, and um, being inspired by the people of this place. Well, Senator Watson, we wish you all the best Thank in you. your new position. We think that those students at the Hobby School of Public Affairs will be in very good hands. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks for your friendship. And thank you for spending so much time uh, lending your perspective to these difficult times we're living in, where we're moving ahead, and a look back at uh, the wonderful things that make Austin such a great place to live. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Take care. You too.